I'm Dr. Tom Fremuth. It's very kind of you to come out and, and listen to me um, uh, talk a little bit about endometriosis. I'm actually really happy to talk about endometriosis because it is Endometriosis Awareness Month, um, but nobody knows that. <laughs> so I thought, people need to know. Oh, perfect. All right. Thanks for coming. Hi. Um, so I was just saying it's Endometriosis Awareness Month, um, and at least a few of you all are now going to um, learn a little bit about it, and I understand some of you already know something about it. <clears throat> but uh, I love to talk, I really do, however. I also read a uh, little thing this morning by Simon Simak, you know, and he was talking about uh, um, active listening. Um, passive listening. We had went through high school and we all passively listened there, sat like little bumps on a log. Please interrupt me. <laughs> um, if you don't understand something, if you want more about it, just talk about it, just bring it up, just ask me, interrupt me. You are not, you know, being rude. Um, we'll get to everything because uh, there's tons of stuff to talk about because it's really, maybe I should say you won't, I won't get to everything, but I hope at least to give you some information that's useful um, and maybe you will see in that information something about you or something about a family member. <clears throat> this usually surprises people that, uh, you know, missing school and missing work and missing activities because of bad periods each month, that's just normal. No, it's not, you know. It can be a lot of things, but it certainly can um, be endometriosis. Um, it's pretty common. Um, as you saw, 176 million women worldwide, 2 to 4 percent of all women, that's women of all ages. Um, endometriosis is a little hard to, to understand, so just to go from the beginning. Um, it is a condition, well to set it up, we'll talk about the lining of the uterus. You know, each month the, the lining of the uterus in here will get thick uh, under the influence of the hormones from the ovaries. And that lining is called endometrium. The egg comes out of the ovary, gets taken up in the tube. If you get pregnant, you get pregnant actually in the tube. The egg comes down, if you don't get pregnant, then all this stuff in here sloughs out. Normal stuff. Not for everybody. For don't know what reason, some folks have this blood, menstrual blood, go backwards. Actually, most people have it go backwards. We just don't know why, when it goes backwards. Some of those cells implant and start growing on things. And they can grow on tube and ovaries and intestines. Um, and pretty much any place. And as you saw there, they have little periods there, just like inside the uterus. And wherever they implant and do that, the body doesn't like it, it gets inflamed. Um, and that essentially is, in simple terms, endometriosis. <clears throat> it's a big problem. Angelina Jolie is in the, the news these days, right? Breast cancer, it's a good thing to have an awareness of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, and um, for that I thank her, but you know, there are actually more women living with endometriosis in America, five million, than there are people with breast cancer. So it's a big deal, and that's why when it's Endometriosis Awareness Month and nobody's talking about it, um, that's not right. Now if you take out in a population of women just the reproductive age women, it's not 2 to 4 percent, it's 6 to 10 percent of reproductive age women who may have endometriosis. So 176 million worldwide. That's a lot of women who are suffering. And suffering from a whole host of symptoms. Obviously, painful cramps with periods, but also bloating, gassiness, uh, cramps, painful intercourse. Painful intercourse, I mean this, I see this um, so frequently that it becomes um, a relationship issue 
I've seen um, uh, a great deal of not just physical pain, but emotional pain because at home, hey, I can't have sex. You know, my relationship with my significant other is tanking. And that causes even an exacerbation of her physical pain. Painful bowel movements. Um, neuropathy, we'll get to that maybe if somebody has a specific question. Infertility, painful urination, blood in the stool, bloody, uh, excuse me, blood in the urine, uh, blood in stool. And these are just some of the, the symptoms that you can get. Endometriosis is also something that, def that generally doesn't um, ride alone. It rides along with a few other diseases at the same time. Irritable bowel syndrome, most people kind of know that. It's a functional dis uh, disorder of the intestines that um, there's no lesions on them, there's, there's nothing that you can see, but it doesn't function right. And you can get alternating bouts of diarrhea, constipation, or just constipation. Interstitial cystitis, nobody talks about that, um, and that's unfortunate because that's common. Interstitial cystitis basically is for the bladder. Generally, inside the bladder, there's a little protective slimy layer. And for whatever reason, that layer has little holes in it. And the um, chemicals and, and impurities in the urine can get through that slimy layer into the bladder wall and irritate it and make it hurt and make it bleed. Pelvic floors, muscle dysfunction, basically we're all held in from below, men and women, by this dual hammock of, of muscles. Uh, and if they are irritated, um, don't function properly, that can cause pain as well. And all these things from endometriosis to all these three things can be happening all in the same person. Um, endometriosis is, you can get a suggestion of what, whether you might have endometriosis just by talking about, you know, how are your periods? Um, how often do you get them? Do you bleed in between? Are they really cramping? Do you have pain with, excuse me, uh, bleeding with uh, intercourse? Family history is very important. Somebody who has a mom or a sister with endometriosis has a 600% increased risk of having endometriosis herself. Pelvic exam, every pelvic exam is uncomfortable, but some are really uncomfortable. And if you have a practitioner who can do a very you know, slow, gentle, targeted exam, you can find specific areas that you might think that, hey, there's some endometriosis there. An ultrasound, especially a targeted ultrasound by somebody who knows what they're looking at, um, might be able to find some endometriosis. So you can get a suspicion of endometriosis, but there's only one way that you can truly know whether you've got endometriosis, and that is to do um, uh, surgery, something known as laparoscopy. Not that everybody has to have that to make the, you know, to take care of the symptoms, but that's the only way you know for sure. And most people know what laparoscopy is, right? You put a telescope in the operating room, in around the belly button, you, you know, put a light in there too, and look around, uh, and you can see endometriosis. And I'll show you pictures of endometriosis, good, bad, and the ugly. Um, so that's a real brief overview, real brief. Um, there are world societies uh, that are interested in endometriosis, and I'm getting more and more to know these folks. And the, the World Endometriosis Society put out a very good awareness film that I just have to share because it says a lot. And she does speak a bit with a British accent. I really do love it. 176 million women worldwide have endometriosis. This is one in 10 during their reproductive years, which are typically from when the period starts until menopause. Symptoms can include pain before and during periods, at ovulation, when going to the toilet, and for some, chronic pelvic pain, as well as fatigue, painful sex, and difficulty getting pregnant. Many people don't realize these are symptoms of endometriosis. This lack of awareness frequently causes a delay in getting treatment. If you have or suspect you have endometriosis, this video will help you understand what the disease is, how it is diagnosed, options for treatment, and where you can find support. 
Endometriosis occurs when cells similar to endometrium, which is the lining of the uterus, are found outside of the uterus. These misplaced cells, known as lesions, grow and bleed each month in response to hormonal changes, just like the endometrium does during the normal menstrual cycle. This results in inflammation, causing scar tissue and adhesions, which are bands of fibrous tissue that stick organs together. Endometriosis lesions are most common inside and on the ovaries, where they are known as chocolate cysts. On the fallopian tubes, on and behind the lower part of the uterus, on the uterosacral ligaments, which are the bands of tissue holding the uterus in place, on the bowel and bladder, and on the lining of the pelvis, called the peritoneum. In rare cases, endometriosis can be found outside of the pelvic cavity. Why some women develop endometriosis and others don't isn't clear. It's likely that certain genes may predispose some women to develop the disease. Endometriosis is not contagious and it is not sexually transmitted. Diagnosing endometriosis can be difficult because it is often mistaken for other conditions with similar symptoms. A combination of pelvic examination and a list of symptoms can help your gynecologist reach a diagnosis. Talk clearly and frankly about your symptoms, how often you have them, and how bad they are. A diagnosis may also require an ultrasound or an MRI scan, but even this equipment will not likely show smaller endometriotic lesions. A conclusive diagnosis may require a laparoscopy. This is a minor surgical procedure where small incisions are made in the abdomen to insert a laparoscope, a long tubular instrument with a light at the end. That allows the surgeon to see endometriotic lesions. There is no known cure for endometriosis, but there are treatments which can help relieve your symptoms and improve your quality of life. The trick is to find the right solution for you. This means talking with your doctor about your symptoms, how they affect your daily life, and discussing whether you want to have children now or in the future. Let's take a look at the treatments currently available. Surgery is the most invasive treatment, but it offers an opportunity for endometriotic lesions to be cut out at the same time as the diagnostic laparoscopy. The success of the surgery will depend on the surgeon. Find a specialist with experience in laparoscopic excision. Hormonal therapy is used to suppress the menstrual period to prevent the monthly bleeding. There are several types of medications that act by shrinking the lining of the uterus and the endometriotic lesions. The oral contraceptive pill is often used as a first treatment, especially in younger women. You can take the pill as you would for contraception, or you can take it continuously for three or more months at a time. Gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogues, also known as GNRH analogues, can be injected monthly or taken daily by a nasal spray. This treatment is typically prescribed for up to six months and creates a temporary medical menopause. Progestins are synthetic hormones similar to naturally occurring progesterone. They are available in the form of daily tablets, weekly or monthly injections, and an intrauterine device. You may need to try more than one type of treatment before you find the one that works best for you and has the least side effects. Over-the-counter and prescription painkillers help by blocking receptors on the nerve endings around the lesions. If you use painkillers, make sure to take only the recommended amount under close monitoring by your doctor. Taking more can risk gastrointestinal problems and painkiller addiction. Endometriosis affects 1 in 10 women during the prime of life. You can fight endometriosis. Don't accept pain as normal. If you cannot go to school or work, or you struggle to carry out day-to-day -day activities, talk frankly with your doctor about your symptoms and ask for a referral to a specialist in endometriosis. Accept that your treatment may change or have to be adjusted depending on how you respond to it. Look after yourself, mentally and physically. Eat well, get regular exercise and get enough rest. Right now, research is taking place to improve your treatment options and endometriosis organizations around the world are ready to provide help and support. You can find them at endometriosis.org slash support. Anybody notice anything in themselves that looks, uh, sounds like that? The one thing that, <clears throat> as I was looking at that, uh, that occurred to me Talk to your doctor, right? Well, it requires that a doctor be able to listen. Um, and um, I'm not sure that everybody 
listens. Yeah, and in part because not everybody knows about it. And one of the reasons that I want to really raise awareness in the community and not just to, you know, to OBGYN docs and our patients, but actually also to our primary care docs because if we can find this stuff early, we have a whole lot more options. And of course, we decrease the suffering of a lot of women. Um, I thought what I'd do is show you a little bit of really what endometriosis is, what it looks like. Um, hard to see, a little dark. I hope these don't project up dark, but this is normal actually. Again, this is a view from that laparoscope. I hope it works here. Okay, well, you talked about the implants of uh, the endometrial cells on the inside of the belly. Uh, and, you know, they don't look really nice. But essentially, those are endometrial cells, and the darkness of it uh, is the blood that the local cells have basically sloughed off, just like a period, and it's collected there. Um, you can see a little whiteness around these areas. The whiteness comes from scarring. And the scarring, of course, comes because the body doesn't like having this stuff out there and it gets inflamed. And after the inflammation is done, you have scarring. You can't see very well, uh, but a little bit you can here. All these little fine red lines are blood vessels that are coming into the area in response to um, inflammation. You'll see a, let me go back here. Um, Hard to see, but right here, there's this little half of a McDonald's arch. Those are the uterosacral ligaments, as the lady said in the film. Um, we call them uterosacral ligaments here in America. But these are the ligaments that hold the uterus to the back, which is back, just to get you oriented when we are looking with this laparoscope. Um, the feet would be on the other side of the screen. Um, the head is up on this side of the screen. The back is down, the belly is up here. So we're looking with a telescope down into the bottom uh, of the um, belly. Uh, and again, these are normal. You can sort of get a sense that, geez, it's nice and glistening and fairly smooth. Uh, this is actually one of those uterosacral ligaments. Same thing here. Again, you can just get to see that there's a lot of tiny little red lines there, and those are the, the uh, blood vessels that signify inflammation. You know, you get a, a splinter in your thumb, you know it's there because it's all red. Um, because, you know, the, the body doesn't like the splinter in there. It gets inflamed, infected then. Um, but a lot of blood vessels is inflammation. And along with all this stuff too, the local hormones cause the development of nerves to grow in the area, and that's how you get you know, the increased pain. Again, this is along the uterosacral ligament. So those are the good is Now we're getting into the bad. Um, all this stuff down here, here's the uterus again, here's the ovaries. All this stuff down here you can't see very well, but that's endometriosis. Um, that's drained out of these ovaries here. The ovaries had so much endometriosis that that collected in there. It became old. It might have initially been red, but then over you know, weeks and months, um, it degrades and turns into a kind of um, brownish, chocolatey looking stuff. And you know, again, all this dark stuff, you can't see real well, but you get a sense of, sense of lumpy bumpiness to the surface rather than a nice smooth surface. That's all endometriosis. So good, the bad, the badder. <laughs> Again, more stuff. Look at all this stuff just growing in there. Um, hurts to look at, doesn't it, actually? <laughs> and now we'll get into the ugly. Um, so here's the uterus again. This is all scar tissue. Here's big ovaries. This actually is a fallopian tube, and all this stuff is just scarred, um, stuck together because of the inflammation from the endometriosis. And then I think this is really ugly because this is actually endometriosis on the large colon for this lady. Uh, and actually this is fairly small. Um, the last nodule that we took out just last week and a lady fortunately didn't go into the muscular portion of her um, uh, large bowel there, but hers was like, gosh, it was a marble size. 
So it's not nice looking. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of different ways to treat it, and, I, and unless you have specific questions about you know, how to treat it medically and such, I don't necessarily have to go over all of them unless you wish, but if you can, you can divide it into, um, uh, what do we got here? One, two, three, five different areas. Lifestyle changes, take for example, pain with intercourse. I have some people with um, 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 enough pain that they can only find one position to have intercourse. That works for them. That's enough of a change. They don't have enough other symptoms that they're okay with that and their partners are okay with that. Non-steroidal agents are things like Motrin, Aleve, and the, the prescriptions that are kind of like next generation Motrin and Aleve that are more effective and more expensive. Hormonal treatments, and there's a bunch of them. None of them is a magic bullet. Um, which ones um, may work for you is uh, something that has to be determined you know, with conversation with, with your OBGYN. Um, but again, these are hormones. They are not going to cure it. Um, once you stop all this stuff, if it's been helping you, when you stop it, your symptoms of endometriosis will come back because it's still there. Surgery is probably the best chance that you have for, for many people, not everybody, but for many people of getting a longer period of time without pain. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean hysterectomy, by the way. Hysterectomy really should be the last thing that you need to do with endometriosis. It's the right thing for some people, but it's not the only thing surgically to do for endometriosis. And especially, I'm so glad that I put that on there, especially since I have some physical therapy friends here. <laughs> physical therapy is also uh, very important. Um, so um, there's a lot of different uh, treatments. Uh, and as the lady on the film said, um, you have to be flexible because what works for you now might not work for you in the, f in the future. So I don't think we really did a good job with endometriosis in the past, and I think still that there are a lot of physicians, and I'll just talk about <clears throat> Lancaster, although I know it, it's a problem outside of Lancaster too. I don't think we do a good job um, uh, with surgery for endometriosis. Um, and I look back more than five years about the job that I did with endometriosis and I cringe. I did not do a good job at all, but um, that has changed. Um, in the past, you know, we do laparoscopy, we take a biopsy, we burn a little bit here and there. Um, but the best thing to do, really, is to cut that stuff out. Um, so, and the best chance you have for the longest period of time with pain relief is that very first surgery. So why is it better to find a doc who can cut it out? And this is the, the reason. This is a diagram of a laparoscopy uh, and a magnified portion of an area that has two implants of, of endometriosis. Now here's a kind of shallow implant that uh, it's fairly wide, and five plus years ago, I take my little um, cautery device and I mm, burn that, you know, a little bit. Um, and then I'd see right next to it a small little area, and I say, oh, that's pretty small. Eh, I don't do too much with that, I'll burn it a little bit. But it's like an iceberg, um, endometriosis. It belies what lies beneath. It might be a small little thing on top but it could have a whole bunch of endometriosis underneath. That's why you gotta find somebody who's comfortable with getting down below this stuff and not just doing a little cosmetic effect on the outside. And hey, I was guilty, I did this years ago, but now you know, I know better uh, and um, the folks in my practice know better. Um, there's a lot of way to, ways to do surgery. Um, I personally, you know, use, I use, <laughs> I use a Da Vinci system. I, it's a computer assisted uh, surgery. A lot of people have heard about it. It is not a cure all. It's just another one of my tools. 
we've done, you know, marketing stuff, robotic surgery, all that. It's still just surgery, and what matters is the person who's sitting there. Plus, I really hate the term robotic because it gives you the idea, you know, that there's um, an autopilot that, uh, you know, you just uh, get out of there that you just press and it just kind of takes care of things for you and it really doesn't. It requires skill. But the system does help and it certainly has helped me do a much better job with our endometriosis patients. Um, just to back up just a little bit here, it has a three-dimensional high definition image of what's going on inside um, when I sit down and, and look through this thing. And then underneath there where I sit, there's these little hand grips that actually allow me to uh, operate. The other piece of this thing is a big, massive, multi-armed octopus, although I guess octopi have eight arms. This only has four. But, uh, you know, it has a light and a camera and then four little arms uh, on which there are instruments that the end of which move a lot like wrists. So it gives me a lot of dexterity, you know, inside the belly. So it's like I've got four arms in there. This in particular is really important that I demonstrate to people. It's not a robot because the instruments up top only respond to what I tell it to do with the um, hand grips beneath. So it's not a robot. And actually, in um, robotics terminology, it's actually a slave, which kind of makes sense because it's a slave to what the surgeon tells it to do, not a robot. So anyway, so that's the surgery that we do. Maybe not that important for you, but you should know this if you do think you have endometriosis or you have friends and family that you have endometriosis, um, you, you want to get the right surgery done if you're going to go that way. This is what we used to do, and this pains me to look at, but when we would think somebody would have endometriosis, oh, we'd get you set up for surgery, and we'd do the first surgery. Oh, great diagnosis, doctor. Yes, you've got, the patient has endometriosis. And we really didn't do all that much about it. Come back, do a bunch of hormones, still have uh, pain. And then we do another surgery and try to get a little bit more, you know, um, uh, aggressive and try to get um, uh, the endometriosis out. And sometimes we did, most times we didn't. And then frankly, I've seen this, not in, in our practice, but in other practice. People get stuck at this like second stage. Uh, and I was at last year's or year before Endometriosis Foundation of America um, conference and they had patients there. And we sat with the patients at lunchtime and ate together. Uh, and there was at least two of them there that had 10 surgeries, 10 surgeries until they finally found, you know, somebody uh, in particular, somebody went to New York, right? Did you go to New York, right? Didn't like them, okay. California, okay. Well, that's all right, I'm not sure who you saw. But in any event, um, until you find somebody who can do the right job for you, people kind of get stuck in here, you know, and doctors can't help themselves sometimes. Uh, sure, I can take care of you. <laughs> it's hard to say, no, I'm not gonna do that. Let's stop, let's stop doing surgeries for right now. and get together, do a good look at what's going on, get a multidisciplinary team together to figure out what's right. This is the way <clears throat> we want to do it. This is the way that I'm committed to trying to get, you know, Lancaster to take care of endometriosis. You do very good imaging. Well, firstly, you do very good listening to, you know, what uh, um, a patient is feeling, what pain she is having. Then you do some good targeted imaging and you make sure the people who are doing the imaging know what the hell they're looking at too. Uh, and that's not always a given, no matter what institution in town you're talking about. <laughs> but you do as good an imaging as you can so that you can plan for one surgery and have everybody there that you need, maybe, 
um, that can take care of this. Whether it means that you need a gastrointestinal surgeon there to um, remove the endometriosis from the bowel uh, or repair the hole that we put in the bowel um, if we, you know, as we take out the endometriosis or if we need a urologist there because there's endometriosis on and in the bladder or the ureter. Uh, you get everybody there that you need and get it done as much as possible with that one surgeon, now, the surgery. Now, you know, that's the ideal, and we will hit that sometimes, but not always. But that is the best way, you know, to try to take care of patients with endometriosis so you don't end up stuck in this second phase getting multiple, multiple surgeries that it's just allowing your endometriosis to get worse. Just a little bit about misconceptions about endometriosis as well. Of course, we talked about the very first misconception, you know, that severe menstrual cramps are normal. Suck it up. Go to school. What's wrong with you? Grow a set. <laughs> um, no. Really bad cramps where you're on the floor um, um, crying uh, and, you know, you'd rather slit your wrist than go to, you know, than move. Yeah, that's not normal. So. Teenagers are too young to get endometriosis, not true. And this is really fascinating to me. Well, because uh, many patients with endometriosis, they start with their symptoms right from the get-go, from their very first period. They are having horrendous cramps. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, then, and if endometriosis is caused by the, the cells from the menstrual period going backward, why is it the first one that's really bad? It didn't have time to go backward yet. Interesting little um, um, information that's just um, was recently um, presented um, and whether it's a clue to something or not, I'm not sure yet, but um, women who as a child, uh, a newborn, that was noted to have a little bleeding from the genital area. It happens, okay, it's not a big deal. Pediatricians say, oh, don't worry about it, it happens all the time. Women who have that tend to have a little bit more endometriosis. Bleeding, um, genital bleeding at birth for a girl is less common if you're a premature baby. Premature babies have less endometriosis. Maybe this is something that happened way, 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 you know, back, you know, even at the embryo embryologic stage before you were born, uh, or maybe shortly after birth. Don't know, but it's just information that supports that this is indeed a misconception. Teenagers are not too young. Actually, there's even been infants that have been found with endometriosis. So, yeah, teenagers not too young. You know, very common. Hormonal treatment cures endometriosis? No. As I said, you, you know, the hormones might make you feel better and that would be great, but it's not going to get rid of it. You stop the hormones, your endometriosis grows again. Pregnancy cures endometriosis? No. Firstly, it would be great if you could get pregnant because sometimes you can't with endometriosis, but um, the next um, in, uh, misconception is endometriosis means infertility? No. Yes, it's true, many people with endometriosis have decreased fertility, but just because you have endometriosis doesn't mean you can't get pregnant. Um, getting back to the pregnancy cures endometriosis, it does, and I've done plenty of C-sections, and I've actually you know, taken out you know, collections of endometriosis from their ovaries at the same time. Um, didn't know it was there, you know, but um, it wasn't cured you know, by nine months of pregnancy, so no, pregnancy doesn't cure it. Endometriosis means infertility. Um, just anecdotal experience, I, I can think of one person anyway, you know, that, you know, I did as good a job as I could at excising the endometriosis. There was just one area that I could not get. Uh, I didn't think I was skilled enough to do it. I left it there, tried to get her to someone who could do it. Well, she came back pregnant <laughs> a few years later, um, and she still had this big nodule that was actually in her vagina of all places. Um, but all the other endometriosis further up was less, and so um, hopefully I was helpful in getting, um, leading to her pregnancy. 
Abortion and douching causes endometriosis. No, it doesn't. Endometriosis on the tubes doesn't cause infertility. I don't know where that came from. Maybe that's something that people in Europe think about. I don't know, but I've never had anybody around here think that. But uh, endometriosis anywhere can cause infertility. So anyway, um, it's a common, uh, endometriosis common causes pain for many women, but some don't have any pain whatsoever. Some people have those big collections of endometriosis on the ovaries and they don't have pain with intercourse, they don't have bad cramps, they don't have bleeding between their periods, they got nothing. And it's like, what is going on here? Um, don't know why, um, it is confusing. It may be um, that uh, women who have really severe disease but very few symptoms, may be that their brain processes pain differently. Uh, it may be um, part of the sort of the parable of the frog in the, in the boiling water. You know, you put a frog into water that's boiling, it'll jump out because it can sense that it's really hot. If you put a, bog, uh, a frog into a pot of water and then slowly, you know, bring up the temperature till it's boiling, it's going to die because it can't sense that slow change. And that may be the problem with endometriosis. If it's slow and indolent growing enough, um, women may get very, very severe disease and just not, you know, know um, or sense the pain that they're having. Just like the frog before it's totally boiled doesn't know that it's, you know, um, in its head, uh, in over its head in hot water. Medical or surgical treatment can help people with their pain. Uh, each person's disease needs to be individualized. There's no one way to do it. I'd love to say surgery would take care of it for everybody, but it doesn't. And I will tell you, it's, you know, uh, it's important to find a, a doctor who says, no, surgery's not right for you right now. And of course, uh, so, this is, this is actually the take-home message, really, that I want to leave you with. There are nuances to this um, disease. There are overlapping symptoms of um, uh, this disease with at least four others. Um, there are multiple treatments, uh, medical treatments, uh, that some will work at some time. There, are, um, there is surgery that you have to be a good surgeon um, uh, to be able to remove this stuff. So there's a lot of stuff. So it really requires, if you want good care, that you find a network of physicians and allied professionals like physical therapists and what have you, you know, with a really special interest in endometriosis to manage this properly. I don't think that we have enough of this yet. I think uh, I know in my own circles, you know, I'm developing and our practice is developing a network of, of uh, physicians and allied uh, professionals to meet this ideal goal. Um, but we'll get better at it and we'll see if we can't um, make it uh, the standard for the company. So don't suffer in silence. Be an endo warrior. So, all right, you all just sat there listening again, even though I told you, hey, ask some questions. Any time for questions before I run this next video, which is a little bit longer, and she also has a British accent. Oh, come on. Go ahead. The only for diagnosis is you're saying laparoscopy, or you don't anything on ultrasound? You, you, you can, um, uh, I do very targeted ultrasounds looking for things. And, and uh, yeah, I can, if I look at it, I can say, yeah, that's going to be endometriosis. But def definitively, 100%, you need to do surgery. But that, that doesn't mean that you don't treat for endometriosis if you haven't had surgery. I mean, um, when I do targeted ultrasounds, you know, I know what it looks like in the belly. I know where to look. I know what it looks like. Um, uh, even though it's always different in everybody. And so I can get a really good hint that there's endometriosis because, you know, if I find something that looks like endometriosis on ultrasound, 
I'll say, yeah, maybe you are the right person that needs to go on to surgery. But I've had somebody who, you know, has very clear bad endometriosis symptoms, but I'm not finding anything that's really, you know, big enough to go after surgically and, and make it, you know, be worthwhile. Then I'll say, hey, you know, let's, let's stick with hormones for right now. If it helps you, great. If it doesn't, okay, then that, that means, you know, I'm missing something or maybe it, there, um, it is deeper than we think. Uh, it can even come back in your surgery curve. Again, there's no cure to endometriosis. It's just controlling the symptoms. Um, for somebody who does a really good job at taking care of endometriosis and, and there's no other way to say it, cutting it out, you know, as much as you can, probably at about five years, there's about still um, 70 plus percent of folks who are pain free. But you turn that around, that's like 30 percent of uh, folks who uh, will have pain. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's pain bad enough that they need surgery again or something. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't cure it, you control it. Does the surgery cause a lot of scarring? Um, the way we do surgery now with the minimally invasive approach, again, I use the Da Vinci system. There's a guy out in Pittsburgh. You know, he does the standard laparoscopy stuff like, you know, like we've done for years. He's just really good at it. And there's a lot of people like that. So um, the minimally invasive approach, whether it's with um, robotics or standard laparoscopy, causes a whole lot, lot less scarring than what was done 20 years ago when you made a big incision. And that, made a, that, that was like taking two steps forward and one step back. You know, when you, you make a big incision in the belly to try to treat endometriosis. Great, you took the endometriosis out, but you just caused a whole bunch of scarring. I have a question. Sure. You did a hysterectomy and you said it was your number one menstrual. How do you still have endometriosis? Um, a couple ways, actually. Um, Believe it or not, you can actually get endometriosis, not just after hysterectomy, but even in the menopause. Uh, and um, it's because from your adrenal glands, there are hormones that are made. Uh, they are male-type hormones. And, and we know this from people of size. Uh, people of size will take their male hormones in their fatty tissue, and they've got enzymes there, that will turn that, those enzymes into an estrogen-like substance, okay? And that can put them at risk for a lot of things like cancer and, uh, and clots and such. Well, those same kind of enzymes exist inside endometrio endometriosis cells. So there may be no estrogen from the um, ovaries anymore, but these endometriosis cells can take the male hormones from the adrenal glands, turn it into an estrogen locally, and just locally drive itself to grow. Now that's not very common, okay? Um, but that can happen. In the, the, there is, perhaps I should say, there's no absolute cure for endometriosis. There's a pretty darn good cure by getting to your menopause uh, or removing as much of it as you can. And, and as, again, I said, you, you don't necessarily need to have a hysterectomy, you know, uh, for, because you have endometriosis. Um, I hinted to it a little bit when I talked about um, women with really severe uh, endometriosis. They don't know that they have it. And I said that their brain may process pain a little bit differently. <clears throat> the brain's quite a, a remarkable organ, obviously. Um, uh, but it can be your friend or it can be your foe. Um, some people can take pain uh, and um, it will be more painful to them than somebody else. And other people can have pain and it's like, you know, you cut their foot off and it doesn't bother them. Um, and the brain does that. It, it modulates how it processes pain from our body. <clears throat> well, we can help that sometimes. Uh, with some medicine, and you've heard about some of this stuff um, on the TV with the direct-to-consumer advertising, like Lyrica, for example. Uh, old, old medicine, too, called uh, amipramine or amitriptyline. They're actually uh, old antidepressant medicines. Uh, but we can use these things um, that, uh, that will help change how the brain responds to pain. 
So you're having the pain, same pain signals, but you're, the, the medications may help you to down-regulate your interpretation of that pain. And that's not something like, you know, you take a Percocet for pain, where, you know, I'm feeling pain, I'll take a Percocet. That's not the way things like amipramine, abitriptyline, Lyrica work. They work over time to change how the, the, the brain responds to pain. <clears throat> and to make it even more complicated than when a, um, a person uses narcotics for a long period of time, that also changes how you respond to pain. So, you know, when they talk about narcotics should be used sparingly, that really is true. Um, I mean, if you have pain, you know, you need narcotics for a while, but um, you really want to try to limit that because not only does, does it risk addiction, but it also, you know, can make the problem worse because it changes how your brain processes pain. So, um, in any event, um, I think that, uh, you know, I've um, given you as much information as you're probably going to observe from one night. Uh, uh, any other questions that you might want to have now? All right. Thank you for, you know, being so kind as to come out to, and to listen. Uh, if uh, you want to leave your email, um, we can certainly send you some links to some of this stuff uh, for information. Um, or you're certainly welcome to see us over at OBGN of Lancaster. Uh, and uh, I wish you well. Thank you. <laughs>